Oh, real quick. Sorry. Let me get some more coffee. Okay. All right. We are back. Another week. Another movie. What have you been up to, Andrew? Not watching movies. <laughs> On that Star Trek train? I'm still, yeah. I mean, it's 170 episodes, so. Where are you at in the world of Star Trek? I just started season five. Okay. How many seasons are there? There's seven. Oh, so you're quite well into it. I mean, you're close. I think the last time we talked, I was on season three. Yeah. Star Trek is just one of those shows where it's just like, I'll watch several episodes in a night. Lately, work has been like really annoying and really kind of, you know, frustrating. (laughs) And I just haven't really felt like watching movies or even going out to the movies because it's just like too much work lately. So there's like no time to like go and see a movie on a weekday. But like when I watch Star Trek, it's like slipping into a nice hot bath. You know, you just can kind of like luxuriate in it and feel its warmth and comfort. It's so comforting. I love it. And season three was a great season. Season four, I would characterize as amazing, Ooh, amazing okay. episodes in season four. Like just like in TNG, there was an episode in DS9 that made me cry a lot. It wow. made me cry throughout the whole episode. That's wild. I mean, Star Trek is that good, dude. It's a roller coaster experience. The season finales of like season three and season four are amazing. Great season finales. And season five has been off to a good start. I just love it. Like, it's just just such a good ass show. I mean, this podcast is basically now turning into a Star Trek discussion podcast (laughs) now. It's like two guys, but only one guy has seen it yet. (laughs) Yeah. So it's like not really a discussion. But once again, I love DS9. I love all the characters. And it's one of the greatest shows I've ever seen. I would say it's about as good as TNG, but they're both very different. So it, it would depend on a person's preference. But even when the show is bad, which it can be for sure, because it's 170 episodes. So of right. course, there's some duds that are like boring or weird or or inconsequential. But even when it's bad, it can be kind of fun to laugh at and watch. It's only a 45 minute long episode. You know, when it's done, it's like, well, that was only 45 minutes, whatever. On to the next thing. Yeah. And then the next episode you watch. Oh, it's an amazing episode. It's perfect. Like, <laughs> So kind of keep powering through. I don't know what I'm going to do after DS9. I'll either watch Voyager which is the next 90s Star Trek show. Yeah. So there's like three 90s Star Trek shows. There's TNG, there's DS9, there's Voyager. They're very easy to remember, by the way, because all three of those shows are seven seasons long, and they all have around 180 episodes each. Wow. Wild. That's incredible. So once DS9 is done, I might start watching Voyager and see if that clicks with me. Voyager has an interesting idea where it's like a crew is on like a Voyager-class starship, and I think they accidentally go into a wormhole and they find themselves like hundreds and thousands of light years away from everyone. Oh, shit. They're basically in an area of space that's never been explored before. So they have no idea where they are. And it would take years to get back to where they were. So they're basically stranded. <laughs> and that's like the idea of that series, which is very cool. DS9, their thing is that they're on a space station. Although lately they've been leaving the space station a lot to go do things. They're on a space station that's surrounded by a lot of interesting things that I won't get into. And TNG is just kind of like the original formula where they're on the starship and they're traveling around. So I either might go to Voyager or I might try to watch the original series again. Because if I watch the original series, then I want to watch all the movies. There's a lot. There's like what, like five or six original series movies. And I think there's like three or four TNG movies. Yeah. Which I've heard are not very good. (laughs) <laughs> but I still got to watch them. I've heard most of the movies aren't that good. Yeah. You know, the original series movies I heard are, are good. Not all of them. <laughs> and then the TNG movies, watch some reviews of the TNG movies. And it seems like maybe the people that made the movies maybe didn't understand the show. Yeah. Well, I think it's challenging because it's a economically different. And it is also just like story wise, right? You have to tell like an entire story in two hours instead of having the ability to, you know, have dozens of episodes to tell a longer story so i think it's just challenging that's not necessarily true though because that's the thing about star trek in a 145 minute episode you can introduce new characters and you can have an amazing story about them and an amazing arcs you can have amazing stories brand new characters that are introduced within a 145 minute episode so when star trek you see it many many (laughs) many many times so with the movie it should be easy to do because now you have even more time but they don't really 
do that. They're more action-y, which it's a sure. movie. So it's like, oh, it has to have more action. Right. You got to pay for all this stuff. Yeah. They kind of lose that kind of the heart of what Star Trek is about, which is not really the action. But anyway, that's what I might do after I finish DS9. Well, speaking of great television, I finally watched a show I've been wanting to watch for a long time, which is Nathan Fielder's The Rehearsal. Have you seen this yet? Yeah, I've already seen it. Yeah. I'm surprised that it took you forever to watch it. It took me forever to watch it because when it originally came out, Emily didn't want to watch it. So I had to find time to watch 45 minute to hour long episodes by myself. And I didn't want to be like what I do with The Wire, which I turn it on when I'm working because, well, Nathan Fielder is one of the greats. I've seen pretty much everything he's worked on or produced or directed. And I think he's an incredible writer and director and wonderful in everything he does. So I needed to be able to focus on just this. And luckily this week, Emily worked a lot, which means I had some free time outside of watching movies to watch the rehearsal. And it's fucking insane. Oh my God. Yeah, it's a really good show. The first episode follows the sort of original premise, which is what I assumed the show was going to be about, which is every episode, he kind of finds a person and basically rehearses whatever a scene. And he basically does the sketch he did in Nathan for you at the bar where he yeah 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 hires a bunch of actors to like repeat a scene over and over again and the first episode's great he finds just like the strangest human beings he's really good at it his ability to utilize craigslist is wild like the yeah. things that people will do is insane and the first episode is funny and touching and at the end of this episode you're like oh that was good that was fun like i had a good time but nothing spectacular about the first episode i mean it's good in itself and it's creative but uh nothing to cry home about as it were and then in the second episode he starts what becomes the entire show which is the rehearsal of raising a child which is just yeah. the wildest idea I've ever. it's so heard. funny <laughs> It's, so, it's so it's so involved. I love like them like moving the kids around and stuff like as they age. It's very funny because of course when working with child actors, especially babies, they can only work for a very limited amount of time. Right. But Nathan Fielder, being Nathan Fielder, he makes it the most involved process it can be. So he does it all in secret. Right. He's like secretly handing them off and all this shit, going through windows. And I mean, he gets like forty real child actors to fucking yeah. It's fucking it's wild and he finds this woman who again just a great however he finds people i don't know how that process works it's just like a crazy person he just finds the craziest people yeah i guess you could describe these people as crazy i mean yeah i'm being kind of i'm exaggerating yeah yeah he's crazy nathan fielder's crazy that's the point of the show is that he's crazy and of course he plays it up which if you hear him like talk about in interviews like he's not i mean he's an awkward individual but he's not to that extent that's what i figured he's playing a character it's a reality show like and nathan for you he plays a character like yeah exactly i remember he once had a conversation with someone else who was doing something similar they were making a show that was basically about themselves but the idea was what if we just like went to 10 on all of your anxieties and fears like what if you were just like the most version of yourself which is kind of nathan fielder's whole thing in all of his shows like he's being just like the most version of himself in all of the bad ways, I suppose. And he starts this process of raising a child and so involved and so insane. And the episode ends. I'm like, well, that doesn't make sense. Like almost nothing has happened. Like very little happens in the episode. I'm like, like how is that the end of the episode? And of course you learn that in all of the subsequent episodes, Nathan Fielder decides to be personally involved in the rehearsal. Yeah, it's so funny. And the woman agrees, which... She doesn't really care. And you can see, like, when she... When he's not around, that she doesn't actually care about the process much. Like, she just wants to kind of live in, like, this really nice house in Oregon and not have a job or do anything. Yeah. She's there for, like, a super long time. I mean, it's probably, like, months and months and months that she's there. Like, yeah. fucking forever. So, you know, she dedicates a good part of her life to just living at this fancy house, not having a job, just being there. And I'm in, really intrigued by the power dynamic. And Nathan Fielder kind of points this out because he's like, I'm in a place of power. Like, this is my show. And so like when he asks her, she says she doesn't care. But I feel like part of her is like, if I want this to happen, like I kind of have to say yes. Because like what would happen if she said no? Yeah. And Nathan Fielder seems like a, a nice human being. And I'm sure he would just go on with it. But it is an awkward place to be in and 
he kind of recognizes that, but at the same time, he kind of doesn't recognize his place of power. And you kind of watch him devolve into taking over this rehearsal. Yeah, that's point of the show, pretty much. And my favorite scene is when he has to call all of the parents and explain to them the situation. Because with child actors, there's a lot of legal complications that go with it and a lot of permission you have to get from a lot of different people. So you have this five minute segment where he's just calling every single parent yeah. and he goes like through this like decision tree. It's very interesting. And it's just this very powerful moment where you're kind of watching him realize what's going on. And one of the challenging things about the work that Nathan Fielder does is he is playing a character, but the best moments in these shows is when he's willing to be vulnerable. And I think in the rehearsal, he can be extremely vulnerable, especially towards the end. And he does a couple other rehearsals. There's the great episode with the Fielder method, which is probably one of my favorite episodes because <laughs> he goes to Los Angeles and he basically convinces a bunch of actors to attend his class, as it were, which is silly in itself. But then he starts to recreate and relive one of the actors and he just goes full out, right? He does the whole nine yards. It's not just like he attends the first day, he attends the second day. And then he takes a job. But then he also does a rehearsal of the rehearsal. And then he comes back. And then he basically starts the rehearsal over, which is, again, wild that the woman agrees to be part of that. And then he starts rehearsing, having conversations with the other woman in the rehearsal, because it's a very yeah. weird relationship between the two, as it would have to be. I mean, it's it's a very strange situation. He starts rehearsing that. And by the last episode, or before the last episode, the second last episode, because he decides to raise their pretend child as Jewish, even though she is, as many people point out, she might be a bit anti-Semitic. A little bit, yeah. She's doing the best she can. I never want to be cruel to any human being, but she may yeah. have some problems with the yeah. Jewish faith. Yeah. One of the episodes is called Apocalypto, because, of course, her favorite director yeah. is <laughs> <It's> Mel Gibson, Gibson. <laughs> <laughs> which is disturbing for so many reasons. He's my favorite. Yeah, it's true. So she leaves, which makes sense because he basically starts the whole process over and she's probably been there for like fucking, I mean, months and months. And then in the last episode, he explores the very problematic nature of child actors, which is something when I was in film school, that was a really big conversation. There weren't a whole lot of conversations we talked about safety on set and that sort of thing. But when we had those conversations, the big things were making sure everyone is safe. And then also working with child actors because there's some very <sighs> ethically complicated things about working with kids because, I mean, they're kids. Their brains aren't fully developed. They don't quite grasp the world in the way adults do. And you see that with one of the kids who doesn't have a father. You can make the argument that like maybe kids shouldn't uh, be actors. Yeah. I mean, I've had discussions with other filmmakers and... <sighs> I don't know how I feel about it necessarily. I think it's, I mean, obviously this is extra complicated and maybe I can understand why Nathan Fielder feels so guilty and he should be forgiven, but also maybe what he did wasn't the best thing. I mean, it's one thing to hire child actors and, you know, pretend to be their dad, but, and you can see him kind of face this accounting for maybe not hiring child actors who don't have a father. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean he had a ton of them right there's like 40 kids so you know one of them not having a father i guess was almost inevitable of course but i don't know i'm pretty split on the issue of child actors i mean at times it does seem rather exploitative especially when we're talking like sitcoms and that sort of thing like we've seen so many examples of child actors whose parents just fucking steal all their money and basically live off their kids funds which is really shitty but on the other hand i mean if a kid loves participating in these kind of things you don't want them to not do it i mean it can be a, a very fulfilling thing for kids or anybody so i don't know i mean i've never worked with kids on a set before all the films i've done and worked on have not involved children no that's not true your baby sister <laughs> which doesn't count <laughs> well sh i took a picture of her she's not even in the yeah, film <laughs> that's a good point yeah she's in a picture she doesn't act in the film and then the only other set i worked on that did have a kid in it, I was the AD on it. So I didn't direct the film. So I never directed anything that had a kid in it. And I don't, 
I don't know if I ever will. It's like a toss up. It's like it is. It's complicated. You could talk about it all day, every day, and there's really no right <laughs> or wrong answer. Yeah. But long story short, strongly recommend rehearsal to anyone who hasn't seen it. Yeah, it's it. a good ass show. How to with John Wilson, always great. How to is also good. Is there gonna be another season of How to? Probably, right? I think so. Yeah. I hope so. It's good. I think it's successful enough. Mm-hmm. You didn't finish The Wire? I'm on the final season of The Wire. Wow. Almost done. I'm almost there. I mean, it takes a long time because they're 45 minute episodes. Well, no, they're closer to an hour long episodes. And then there's 13 episodes per season. And just a lot of shit goes on. Season four is good. Yeah. I still don't quite get why people love it so much. I mean, even you know, I'm on the final season. So We didn't talk about season four. I think you were on season three when we last talked. So season four is all about the children. It's all about the kids. It takes place in the school. It's very interesting and intriguing. And one thing that is very impressive about The Wire is how well researched it is. I mean, they clearly do a shit ton of research and they understand the legal system and the school system to the nth degree. And I'm very impressed by that. But sometimes that can be a little boring (laughs) at times. Yeah, McNulty is almost not in the show at all. He's maybe in one episode, but they basically cut him out of the show. And it spends a lot of time with kids. Kids are actually almost the entire season. Funny enough, it's almost all kid actors. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Pretending to sell drugs and uh, murder people and all that kind of shit. That's (laughs) cool. But it's definitely my favorite season so far. I love all of just the complications that come with schools and kind of the shady ways in which schools participate in things. Yeah. A lot of different perspectives. You see kind of perspectives from like child psychologists, from school attendants, from teachers to the mayor is still like a big part. Like you have the guy who's uh, running for office at the beginning of the season and then wins halfway through the season. And like just the complications of what, a city mayor of a city like Baltimore has to deal with and how they basically whatever decision they make, like someone's going to hate them, like no matter what they do, (laughs) (laughs) like there's no good decision ever. It's just a like series of bad decisions they have to make. And that's just the job as it were. It's good. I like it. I just started season five yesterday. So I'm only on the first episode, just started it. I know the final season is about the press, which seems intriguing. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, There were no wiretaps in the fourth season, by the way. They've kind of abandoned that entirely. There's no, I don't even think there's a wiretap in the third season. They're over wiretaps. (laughs) Yeah. There's not even like, in the fourth season, there's not really any investigation taking place. I mean, there's involvement with like the police, but there's no like big investigation. They've kind of abandoned that. And I think that's what the fifth season too. Like they're, well, I don't know. They might go back to it, but because the thing about the first, second, third season is like at the end of the season, you know, they, each season, they have a different office. And at the end of the season, they'll like gather all their boxes, you know, of all the reports that they made <laughs> and they'll turn off the lights and they'll step out of the room. Yeah. But uh, they don't do that in season four. There was no big investigation that season, which hmm. I liked better, honestly. And season five, I mean, this is it. This is the final one. I'm interested to see how they wrap it up. I probably never would have watched the show if it wasn't on in the background. I wouldn't say I don't recommend would you it to even, people. Would you even watch the show if it wasn't considered one of the greatest shows ever made, you know? No, I probably yeah. never would have turned it on. I mean, getting through the first season and even second season is such a slog that I question if it's worth it. I mean, honestly, yeah. <laughs> you could probably just go to the third season and it would take some time to figure things out. But I don't know. Maybe there's something there. I think it could be done. I think if you're like, I kind of want to check this show out, but I don't know if I like it. Maybe just start with the third season and see if you like it. Because the season's like, yeah, it's the same characters, but you really don't need to watch them in order. I mean, if you watch them out of order, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> so if someone was to skip the first two seasons, I think you'd be fine. I think you have a little catch up to do, especially at first. But once you figure out who everyone is like, yeah, I think you'd be fine. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, It's okay. Yeah. I don't have a whole lot to say about the wire, honestly. I mean, I, yeah. it's fine Probably that overrated. it's on, but it's definitely overrated. 
I think my next watch is probably gonna be Seinfeld because I want something funny. I want something short. And even though I watched Seinfeld a lot as a kid, I love Seinfeld. I probably haven't actually seen that many episodes. Like I've never I've sat down and watched. We, Seinfeld. we, we started watching it again when they put it on Netflix and uh, we, we kind of stopped, but there's never a bad time to watch the show. Yeah, I feel um, like it's a great show to have in the background because it's a pretty, I mean, it's a talk heavy show, right? It's it's mostly a talking. I mean, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a sitcom. Pets, right? Yeah. Um, you've never seen Curb, right? No, haven't seen Curb yet either. Which I know you've talked about a lot and we've talked about yeah, the I've podcast talked about before. A lot, yeah, Curb is really good, yeah. Yeah, Curb, I don't know. Your Seinfeld Curb would be good. Um, For sure. If you don't want a laugh track, Curb is good. I know that's that's part of the reason that I haven't gotten to Seinfeld before is laugh tracks annoying, but it's still a good show. Yeah, despite I, the I, kind of anti- antiquatedness. Antiquated. Of it. Getting the yeah. laugh tracks is, is hard for me. Laugh tracks can really put me off a show, but I know how great everyone says Seinfeld is. Like I know how much you love so it. Fucking so. good. Yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> yeah. So a lot I'm of people our age don't like it. I've met a lot of people our age that really? just do not really care about the show or hate it or think it's huh. lame or cringy or something like that and i completely disagree i think the show is still <laughs> i we will watch it sometimes and i mean we laugh mm. so much like it is such a good funny show about really stupid idiots <laughs> like that's really what, it's really just like it's really yeah. just like a show about like stupid people and curb your enthusiasm is is a show about a stupid person um <laughs> and it's just yeah i i love i really really like those larry david shows so I'm going to get into it. I think it'll be nice because the last couple of shows I've had on in the background, Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul, The Wire are all very serious <laughs> shows. I mean, Better Call Saul a little bit less, but even still, I need a show that's less serious. <laughs> I need something a little bit lighter. It's too much seriousness in my life. I just need to. There's probably no other sitcom that's worth watching than Seinfeld. I can't think of another show, show like that where I'm like, yeah, you got to watch it. I mean, like there are shows that are similar, like Arrested Development and stuff like that, that are great. Which but is I a mean, 10 out of 10. perfect show. We've we we've, we've all seen these shows, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like Seinfeld is definitely a big empty spot for me. I mean, obviously, you can't be a kid raised in the early 2000s and not have seen that show. I mean, yeah, I don't think like that's my dad possible. loves it. My dad's like, he <laughs> loves that show. Yeah, he would have. Yeah, it on all the every time. dad does. I don't think there's a dad every in the world dad, that doesn't every love dad, that show. Yeah, every dad loves Yeah, it's a dad show <laughs> for sure. Oh my god, I love that show. <laughs> I need I need oh. I should get back into it when I get the chance. But yes. once again, I'm Star Trek build. Star so. Trek. <laughs> yeah. There's probably like a Star Trek episode in Seinfeld that I'm forgetting. Probably. Yeah. I'm sure there is. I doubt <laughs> there's not. Did we talk about uh, Pinocchio on this? No, we didn't, because I didn't watch the last time it was here, right? No, I didn't see it. It's very Guillermo del Toro. I mean, there's a reason it's called Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. <clears throat> he, he gets all of his weird creatures, yeah, all of his uh, you know, mystical sort of things. It's a very mystical film. It's pretty long. It's two hours. It's pretty long for an animated film. Yeah. I'm terrified of puppets, and I don't think if you are terrified of puppets you should watch this movie because everyone looks like a puppet and pinocchio looks f- well he scary. is scary <laughs> he is a puppet yes but even when he turns into a real boy still a puppet very scary it's <laughs> not a children's film i would not describe this i would not show this film to children no, I, don't. I, I think I if you showed that. this film to children they would be scarred for life it's got a lot of fascism is it in it uh yeah a lot more fascism than i expected mussolini is in it wouldn't expect that <clears throat> well even the original pinocchio is kind of scary it's oh yeah scary. original pinocchio oh. is terrifying but not mm-hmm. this is more terrifying mm-hmm. more people dying more scary creatures more fascism i mean the movie opens with a boy being brutally murdered by uh, a bomb just a bomb being dropped cool. on a boy in a church it's yeah, like it's the opening Toro, scene of this yeah. movie <laughs> yeah, oh yeah it's children. it's got all of the del toro moments i mean it takes place during world war ii it's got all those mystical creatures it's very dark 
animation's very good. If you love stop motion, you're going to love this. As I mentioned in our regular podcast, it is created by the people who did Fantastic Mr. Fox. So it does have all of those great vibes in it. Looks very good. Very sad. I mean, it's a really good film. <laughs> it's a very good rendition of Pin- Pinocchio. It's a terrifying film. If you have children, please do not show this to them. They will be haunted. But <laughs> I enjoyed it. Well, enjoy is probably the wrong word. It was a good experience to have. <laughs> okay. I, mean, I guess it's, I guess it has a good ending, but the ending's also pretty sad. It's all sad. It's just a lot of that's cool. Sad. <laughs> Speaking of something that isn't sad. As you know, I've been going through all of the Daniel Craig, James yeah. Bond movies. It has been my main focus. I don't know why, but once I saw all well, Casino yeah, Royale, I was just obsessed with seeing all of the Daniel Craig, James Bond movies. And just a few days ago, yeah. I finished the series. I watched No Time to Die. So since we last talked, mm-hmm. I watched Skyfall, Spectre, and No Time to yeah. Die. Quantum Skyfall... Solace. Oh yeah, I also watched Quantum Solace. Quantum Solace is I think I think the directing the in that one. movie is bad. It's the worst one. <laughs> There's nothing memorable about that movie. I genuinely don't remember almost anything that happens in that movie. It's just very prototypical James Bond. You know, he gets a martini. Although Jeffrey Wright's in it. So there's that. Which he's not in Isn't Skyfall he in all Spectre. Them? He's not in Skyfall oh, or Spectre. Oh, he's not in Skyfall or Spectre. Which is lame. I think he should be in all of them because he's what the is. best. I love he's good. Uh, Jeffrey Wright in these movies. But Quantum of Solace, other than Jeffrey Wright's performance, it, nothing really it's happens. A, it's a very left-wing movie. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it just happens to not be very good at all. It's it's left-wing in comparison to like the other James Bond movies, which are very reactionary. Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> But uh, yeah, Quantum Solace is just the 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 directing is bad if I remember correctly. Like it just, just yeah, the action well-made. scenes are just okay, and it doesn't look that great, and nothing really happens. Underwhelming experience overall. I mean, mm-hmm. if you're gonna watch, I think I mean, uh, you're gonna if, watch all of them. You still should watch. I think it, it's but... a. I think it, is Quantum Solace the one with the Radiohead song. I think it is. It must be because Skyfall is Adele. Right. Spectre is a camera Sam Smith and No Time to Die is yeah, then, then yeah, so it has then to yeah, be Qu- Quantum of Solace Quantum is the I like the Radiohead song, I like Radiohead song. Yeah, the, the song's good. If nothing else. It's the Skyfall. <laughs> I love I love the uh, Skyfall opening songs and song. and number. Songs of Blast, the opening James Bond I saw this movie credits the thing. Skyfall? Yeah, I didn't fun. watch any of the other movies. <laughs> so you I had no see... context coming into this movie. I didn't, I didn't see Casino Royale. I didn't see Quantum of Solace. <laughs> I didn't see... I, I was just like... I didn't. I don't even think I really even like knew that there were other movies. <laughs> you just saw... I mean, I guess you can see Skyfall on its own. I think I went Although... on a date. I think I went on a date um, okay. to see Skyfall. Um and you know I don't remember the story but I do remember it, it looked amazing. It's I, I it's a very luxurious movie if I remember correctly. And Sam Mendes, I don't really care for that guy, but I think he nailed the movie. <laughs> if I remember. Well, he's correctly. working with Roger Deakins, so I whenever too, the... I another part I remember is him. Um, uh, who's who's the bad guy in it? Benicio? No. Yeah. Who's it? Uh, let me see. Let me look right now. It's uh, I, I just Javier remember Bird. the villain. It's Javier, Javier Bardem. Bardem. Yeah, yeah, he when he had when he meets him like in the really big <laughs> spacious room. I remember that scene as well. Yeah, Skyfall is definitely the best looking of all of the films of the Daniel Craig films. It's beautiful. I mean, Roger Deakins, one of the yeah, great he, cinematographers. He nails it. I mean, only cinematographer to ever be knighted. So, yeah, clearly knows what he's doing. And him and Sam Mendes work on a lot of films together. They're best buds. So it looks great. Starts off really great. Love the song. I think this film's definitely one of the slower ones. There's a lot of time where not very much happens. 
I, I just remember him being like in the tropical area and for no, <laughs> you know, it's like him like doing nothing, right? It's just him kind of yeah. like meeting women and stuff, which I guess is like a typical James Bond thing. Classic James Bond well, thing. Well, once again, I don't remember too much about like this in the movie story wise. It was over 10 years ago. <laughs> I mean, yeah, 2012. It's been a hot minute, but it looks spectacular. The uh, three movie arc of Judy Dench <laughs> is wonderful. And it's very clear that Skyfall when it was made was made to be the finale of a trilogy yeah which so i understand why like dion craig was angry to have to do two more films after this because this does wrap everything up pretty nicely i mean if they just made these three films the ending. that'd be fine uh javier bardem kills judy dench and himself <laughs> they're they're like going through the ice and then there's like the fog and then they go to the church and uh i sort of will die that. yeah it looks great. It's probably one of my favorite endings because one of my big complaints with James Bond movies is the final action sequences are usually pretty lame. Like the final acts. I'm never a huge fan of them. Except in Casino Royale. I mean, that's fucking insane. That one's cool. Fucking, that's great. It's great. Fucking building yeah. just collapses and they're fighting through it. But definitely in Quam Solace, it was lame. But Sky Falls is good. Beautiful film. Definitely a touching ending if it were to be a trilogy. But then there's Spectre. I haven't seen Spectre uh, and I haven't seen No Time to Die. You should skip Spectre. No, I'm going to watch it. I don't care. <laughs> no, I'm still going to watch it. I, I, but I know, I understand well, though that maybe it's like the, it's either, I understand that Spectre is either the worst or second to worst movie. So, okay, you'll have to, if you want to watch No Time to Die, you'll have to watch Spectre because No, no Time going to Die to, yeah. does deeply involve all the other films like you yeah. cannot go it's the only one that you cannot go into without seeing the other films because it is deeply ingrained in the other films and it will not make any sense if you haven't seen the others specter sam mendez i mean i it might be my least favorite it might be worse than quantum solace not necessarily because the action scenes are bad the action scenes are fine the opening credits are fine but it is the most James Bondy in the silliest way, because basically the whole idea of Spectre is like there's this great world order and everyone's connected. Nice. Um, it's and it's called Spectre. Yeah, called Spectre. <laughs> it's cool. And uh, I mean, Christoph Waltz is like the main villain, which is fun. Yeah, you know, he's great as they always. They get good villains for all these. They get good villains for all these movies. These the new villains movies. are always great. They, I mean, they, they get the best actors. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. They get the best. Well, actors except for well, except for maybe Malik, but I don't know. You can. I haven't seen it, so I don't know. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. But okay, Spectre is the silliest and takes itself way too seriously, and is kind of lame. I mean, the action sequences are fine, so but nice. one of my big complaints is every love interest James Bond has, other than his <laughs> love interest in Casino Royale, is fucking stupid. They're lame. They're lame as fuck. Uh, there's just no chemistry ever. I don't know why. I don't know if Daniel Craig is just incapable of having chemistry with a, a female human being or just something about people can't seem to write women in these films. I don't know. I mean, there's yeah, some good like female it. characters, like Judy Dench is great, but all of his love interests, especially Inspector, because she's also the love interest in No Time to Die, which not a fan. It's uh, Na Naomi Watts. I don't know how people feel about Naomi Watts, but I think the performances she gives are <sighs> not my favorite in the world. I think there's a, uh... and I don't know if that's necessarily her fault or the writing or the plot or a lot of other things, but. There's not much good to say about Spectre. The last sequence is pretty cool. It's basically the sequence of Casino Royale, but it's a bigger building. It's a building that collapses and he has to save someone. But this time he does it, though. This time he does save her instead of not saving her. So it's a little redemptive, but it's the same scene, except not as good. <laughs> but a bigger building. <laughs> so, I mean, you have to watch Spectre because it's, deeply ingrained uh with the other movies but probably my least favorite and then there's no time to die which i can see why they had to postpone this movie because the <laughs> the bad guys 
evil plot, Rami Malek's evil plot, is that he is going to release a virus. Let's go. That is going to kill. Yeah, it predicted. People. It predicted the. It predicted it. <laughs> Bro, movies are real life. <laughs> life real imitating life. art, my friend. So I understand why they no. pushed it back so yeah. long. Because I didn't understand at first. I was like, why do they keep pushing this movie back? Like at some point, you have to release it. It was definitely because the uh, relationship to COVID is disturbing. It's so funny, to say the least. I love it. So strange. But it No Time to Die is great. Okay. Everything about it is great. I mean, it definitely wraps up the series in a great way. Everything's very involved. There's a lot that has to do with Casino Royale more than anything else. And his love with Casino Royale and his love interest with Naomi Watts from Spectre. Great action sequences. Oh, I didn't mention the one good thing about Spectre. If there's anything good to say about Spectre, the opening sequence of Spectre is a very long one -er. It's probably like a four or five minute one -er in Mexico City or somewhere in Mexico on Dia de, Lo Dia de los Muertos. And it follows James Bond as he like walks through a crowd and goes into a hotel and stuff. Only cool. good thing I can say about Spectre. It's a really cool one -er. The rest of the film is trash, but that is a really cool one -er. So you could watch the first five minutes and then you don't have to watch the rest. Just watch the one -er. <laughs> Okay. Anyways, No Time to Die has some really cool car sequences. They bring back the car from Skyfall, the like silver, I think it's an Aston Martin or something. It's got the guns on it. Yeah. Really cool car. <clears throat> Paper James Bond car. They're driving around. They go to all these cool places, cool venues. Rami Malik is actually in very little of the film. I would say of all of the villains, he is in it the least of any James Bond villain. And I'm not exactly sure why. He's also he sucks. the okay. least fleshed out of any of the villains, I think. I don't think his plan is bad. Well, he doesn't seem to have a plan, to be honest. Like, he wants to <laughs> release this virus in the world, which I get that part. But there's no reason. Like, all of the other villains have a reason to do what they do. Even, like, Christoph Waltz, I guess, sort of has a reason. But there's no, like, reason he wants to kill all these people. It doesn't seem clear to me why he wants to do it he just he's evil evil i guess i don't know so when people complain about ryan malik's performance in it i don't think it's necessarily his fault i don't think he was given a whole lot to work with in this film but other than the villain thing i think this movie does really well i think it's a great james bond movie i think it wraps everything up very nicely and he dies at the end of the movie i never thought they'd kill a james no. bond but they kill him they yeah, kill they James Bond. Kill I didn't think you could do that. James Bond's supposed to live forever. No. He I was I was uh surprised by it, even though this movie's come out. You were you were surprised? I didn't know he died. He never dies. In no other James Bond movie does he die. It's the last movie. I I I I figured he was gonna die, and of course I was spoiled that he was gonna die, but I mean, I don't know. There's like 50 James Bond movies, and he's never died in a James Bond movie before. This is the first James Bond movie where he's died. Well, cool. <laughs> cool. <laughs> he's dead. He's finally dead. They obviously were trying to set up another James Bond movie, so I'm interested to see if the next James Bond movie, they bring back most of the cast. Because basically in each movie, they introduce a couple of new characters and bring back a couple old ones. I like the guy who plays Q. <laughs> I don't like... I think Ralph Fiennes is a good actor, but I don't like him as M. I think Judy Dench was a better M, and I don't think they should have killed her. That's just me. I'm. I'm gonna stick. I'll by eventually that. watch them all. I need to like uh, rewatch Skyfall and then watch the rest. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I think at the end of the day, I think we can agree that um, probably <laughs> Casino Royale is the best one. Yep. If I were to rank it, my final ranking. Sick. Yeah. Casino Royale, Skyfall, No Time to Die, Quantum of Solace, Spectre. There you go. It's the definitive list. If anyone asks, that is the definitive. Yeah, that's the Daniel definitive Craig. one. No one, you know, <laughs> that's probably, yeah, that's probably how it's, yeah. Yup. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. That's all the movies I watched this week were 
James Bond yeah. movies. I did. I did watch like three other. I did watch three movies this week. This oh. these past two weeks. I go did. On. I did. So we decided to go and see the new Brandon Cronenberg movie, Infinity Pool. But before mm-hmm. we did that, we went ahead and watched his other feature films. He only has two others. We saw okay. Antiviral, and then we saw Possessor. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we went and saw Infinity Pool. And uh, um, Antiviral is a is an interesting debut. It's a future in which everyone is super. It's a uh, celebrities what a concept movie. What's that mean? And it it's like you know like uh I'm co- I'm copying uh film writer and critic oh, okay. Will Sloan Got and you, uh yeah. he 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 uh talks about like the politics what a concept movie where it's like oh, a yeah. stupid it's like a dumb movie about like wow politics wow you know democracy isn't that crazy <laughs> this is like that but with celebrities it's like celebrities what a concept and it's a <laughs> gotcha. world in which people are so obsessed with celebrities and they're so wrapped up in them that there are these like mil- what I what I'm assuming are multi-million dollar companies that are clinics where people go in and they are given um, a disease or like a virus mm-hmm. from a celebrity. So like if celebrity had like had or has like um like herpes or something like that, they are given sure. it to okay. make them feel even closer. There's of even course. like a it, it's really weird. And and <laughs> there's also there are butchers that genetically modify the meat of celebrities and people eat them. So it's like, yeah, it's just kind of like really kind of exaggerating how people, I don't yeah. know, want to feel close to celebrities that they get they get their diseases as if they've been near them and they want to eat their flesh or whatever. Uh, it's a little ridiculous, but I, I admire the the tenacity of it. Just kind <laughs> of how uh, it, its ideas. It, it's very awkward, but I, I didn't mind that too much um you know brandon cronenberg of course you know in all of these movies he definitely uh takes a little bit after david cronenberg <laughs> but in his newer movies i think david cronenberg also takes something from his son um antiviral was cool i would <clears throat> sort of recommend it um I, w- I don't know if it's like a fun movie but it's definitely an interesting one and <laughs> there's some fun there's some good stuff in it uh it's kind of like a mystery story too there's some really cool stuff in it honestly as well um but i think his best movie is possessor his second movie they came out a few years ago that movie is really cool that movie is about um a person um who is an assassin but what happens is is that what they do is that they put a thing in a person's brain and then Mm -hmm. this person can go inside of this person's brain and take over their body and and then while they're in that body they will kill someone, a target that they're being paid to kill. I see. Um, and uh, she's on a job, and the assassin, and something goes wrong. Essentially, like Uh-oh. something is wrong sure. with the technology, and things aren't paying out, panning out very well. Um, pretty simple story. Um, really good movie, really solid. I, I think it's his best looking movie. I think like the idea and the story is really good. I think it's really scary i think it's quite scary oh, shit. um i think it's a good looking movie yeah i think out of all three of his movies it's his best one and then we went and saw infinity pool which was kind of a disappointment in my opinion um i thought it was decent but i didn't think it was anything that special or crazy it's mm-hmm. just a movie where this couple goes on vacation in this made-up country that's really weird it's like a weird country sure um and it kind of infinity pool kind of reminded me of crimes of the future a little bit it looks like it's almost <laughs> same it looks like it's almost filmed in some of the same locations probably uh probably yeah and <laughs> and um i'm not gonna spoil like the idea like the main kind of like sure. kind of at like kind of like aspect to it like the 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 main kind of like idea sure but I didn't find it very engaging or interesting. Okay. It was a little interesting, but there was something kind of missing about it. Um, and I don't know. I didn't find it a very like exciting movie. I didn't find it particularly scary. Um, I wasn't super moved by it. 
Um, I thought the acting and actors were just okay. You know, Mia Goth's in it. She gets really annoying by the time the movie ends. I find her performance. I found I her performance was really annoying. Wow. Um. I don't know. I've seen some really positive reviews of it, and I, I, maybe I'm being a little hard on it. Mm. But I don't know. There's something kind of missing. The, the The thing about all these Brandon Cronenberg movies that that I think it's an unfortunate quality of them, even though they are, I think, pretty good overall. There's something kind of like there's there's kind of like something kind of soulful missing from them. Yeah. Um, David Cronenberg's movies, one of my favorite directors. Mm-hmm. His movies are weird. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but they still kind of have like a very human, soulful, kind of heartfelt, like aspect to it. Sure. Yeah. Um, all of his movies I've seen, and these movies they just feel a little bit too empty. Mm. Um, even though they are cool. <laughs> so, yeah, that's kind of my main kind of crux with these movies. They're kind of frustrating, but I don't think any of them are terrible. Um, you know. Especially Possessor. Okay. I'll have to check them out. Yeah, I've been a bit skeptical. I mean, would you describe his films as... Do you think his influence from his father is a little too much? Well, that's the thing. It's like, I think like, especially in Antiviral and Possessor, his ideas are cool. Mm Mm-hmm. Even if they are influenced from his dad, I don't think they're necessary. I don't think that's the problem. I just feel okay. like there's just something missing from like there's just like a, there's like a connection, an emotional right. brain, un, you know, undefinable connection that's missing. Right. While David Cronenberg's movies, he does it effort- effortlessly, I, <laughs> almost effort- effortlessly, to yeah. help me establish some kind of like look with it. Outside of it, just looking cool and being having a cool kind of like science fiction right. idea. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you know, if you like David Cronenberg, I mean, it's more Cronenberg stuff. Yeah, you know, that's cool. <laughs> so, okay, interesting. Yeah, I still need to watch more David Cronenberg. I think the only Cronenberg, I only seen two Cronenberg films, and one of them was for the podcast. So, yep. Obviously, you want to watch The Fly and some of the yep. other stuff. But I'm approaching seeing all most all of his features. I think there's a few I haven't seen yet. Damn. He's got quite, doesn't he have like, he's quite a few, yeah, doesn't he? He at least yeah. has like a few dozen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that guy's been doing it forever. Oh, I guess Syncrans Future too, of course, but. Yep. Yep. That's, that's pretty much it for me. That's all me I got. Too. Cool. Yeah. That's the movies. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. All right. Thank you all for listening. Thank you. Bye.